The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, how we give you thanks for this Easter day. We praise you, O Lord, for the privilege of coming to lift up praise and claim the power of resurrection. Guide us and lead us as we worship. Through Christ we pray. Amen. Let us listen to the opening voluntary. Our heavenly honkers are here and they will share with us a hymn medley. Let us listen. Easter people, let us sing. Let us stand together and share our words of greeting with one another as we prepare to sing the praises of God. You'll find the words of greeting printed in your bulletin. Let us share them responsively as we greet one another in the name of the risen Lord. Our words of greeting, out of the darkness of grief and despair comes a message of hope. Christ is risen. We run to the tomb to see for ourselves, and it is true, Christ is risen. Christ is risen we hear a voice call our name, and we know our risen Lord is with us now and always. Christ, Christ is, is risen. risen. Christ, Christ is, is risen indeed. Thanks be to God. Indeed, how good it is for us to greet one another in the name of the Lord and to be able to share this Resurrection Sunday together and find hope in the midst of all that our world is experiencing. We come to find new life, hope, and promise of everlasting life. We invite you to find the attendance registration pads. Normally, they're located on the end of the pew near the center aisle. If you take a little extra time and leave your email address or if you're one of our uh, family members here, uh, our congregation, simply update your information. And if you're a guest with us, uh, we'd love it if you'd leave your email address or address so that we may more formally uh, contact you and express our appreciation for your presence in the days ahead. In addition to our regular offering, Sunday offering, many of you have received the Easter offering envelope, and we invite you to make your Easter offering throughout these days of the Easter tide in the week today and the weeks to come. You'll notice on at Huntsville First an opportunity for you to participate in a workshop this coming Saturday. Uh, there is no obligation, but it's a workshop in which you will find and discover uh, uh, the ways in ministry of Stephen ministry. We are a Stephen ministry congregation. It simply means lay people sharing with others, listening to others, primarily listening in times of birth, marriage, death, divorce, serious illness, retirement, other transitions in life. So come, if you will, to the workshop. You may register according to the numbers and email addresses there listed on the front page of your bulletin. At the close of this service, during our closing hymn, we invite you to come and be a member of the choir. The choir will be singing the Hallelujah Chorus is our tradition here at First Methodist. And so during our closing hymn today, as we sing, He Lives, come forward, claim a piece of music, and share with us the Hallelujah Chorus, your opportunity to be in the Easter Choir. We hope you'll come and share in that joyful moment, time of praise as we sing the Hallelujah Chorus at the close of our service today. And as you exit, perhaps it'll be helpful to you and especially to those who are coming in for the 11 o'clock service. If you'll exit through these doors to my left and to my right, just come forward and exit. It will take you right to Clinton Avenue or out the side doors to Green Street. So we invite you to come forward and exit in as much as possible. And if you have to go that way, you'll be greeting our 11 o'clock congregation, but uh, that will make it a little bit easier for you. Let us pause now and remember those who are in need, certainly tragedies throughout the world where people die or injured, even in the midst of worship. Let us pause and remember, even though we celebrate resurrection today, the reality of the cross and death is still among us. Let us pause and ask God to meet the needs of those here and throughout the world. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, we come to you in the name of the risen Christ who indeed has come to us in the form of your everlasting life. 
How we thank you, O Lord, for giving us the voice of a child this morning, a voice that will send promise through our souls, helping us to know that your message will come even through a little child, calling us to live and surrender our lives in the innocence of your love. Thank you, Lord, for speaking to us on this day through Easter lilies and through those who are Easter people coming to surround us and touch us and love us and care for us. On this day, O oh God, we do acknowledge that we have not loved you with our whole hearts. We have doubted as Thomas doubted on that first Easter. We have simply said we will not believe unless we see the nail prints. Help us, O oh Lord, that we may see hear, understand, and believe that you are alive, that you are here to give us new life, abundant life, and eternal life. Lord, we pray that you would reach down and touch those who are hurting in disease and loss of life in anger and hatred and war and that which steals, kills, and destroys. Help us to know that indeed you have come that we might have life. Use us even as your instruments that we may complete this Easter story by going out and telling everyone that your desire is for love and healing and hope. Guide us, O oh God, and help us to pray. Teach us to pray even as you taught your disciples long ago to pray by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. The reading this, um, this morning is from the Old Testament, pages 541 and 542, 542 in your Pew Bible, Psalm 118, starting with verses 1 and 2, and then going down to 14 to 24. I'll be reading from the Revised Standard Version. O oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His steadfast love endures forever. Let Israel say, His steadfast love endures forever. The Lord is my strength and my song. He has become my salvation. Hark, glad songs of victory in the tents of the righteous. The right hand of the Lord does valiantly. The right hand of the Lord is exalted. The right hand of the Lord does valiantly. I shall not die, but I shall live and recount the deeds of the Lord. The Lord has chastened me sorely, but he has not given me over to death. Open to me the gates of righteousness, that I may enter through them and give thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord, the righteous shall enter through it. I thank thee that thou hast answered me and hast become my salvation. The stone which the builders rejected has become the head of the corner. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day which the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. For those of you I don't know, my name is Drew Holland. I'm one of the associate pastors here at Huntsville First United Methodist Church, and it is a true blessing for me to share God's word with you today, which comes, as Carol read, from Psalm 118. Over the season of Lent, we have been covering the Psalms and talking about prayer, and this is the last in that installment, so we're glad that you could be with us here to hear about this Psalm of Resurrection. Will you pray with me? Lord, speak through me, and if necessary, in spite of me, but most of all, speak, Lord, for your servants are listening. Amen. So on the Thursday before Easter last year, disaster struck. I was typing out my Easter sermon 
Things were going pretty well until I saw in the bottom right-hand corner of my screen on my laptop, it said battery is running low. Now, usually I would just plug in my charger. However, my charger was already plugged in. You see, I had been having trouble with my charger over the last few days, and I knew it wasn't going to last too long. I was just hoping it would wait until after Easter. So I knew I had about a minute left. I typed out all the ideas that I could. I moved my cursor up to the top left-hand corner of the screen to file, and I was going to click print, but zap. It died. So I let out this gasp in my office, and several of the staff came in to my office, and they asked, what's going on, what's going on? And so I told them what was going on, and uh, Megan Davis, one of our uh, trusty staff members, uh, some of you may know Megan, she, uh, she came in and she said, well, uh, what kind of computer is that? And I told her, and she said, well, I think I used to have one of those, and I may still have the charger at my house. So she raced back to her house about five miles away. She came back. She had the charger in hand. We plugged it into the wall. We put it in the input on my computer, and yes, it worked. And before I even knew what I said, the words came out, and I said, Megan, you have saved Easter. <laughs> if you don't get the joke, Megan didn't save Easter, right? God saved Easter through raising Jesus from the dead. My aims were misplaced. Oftentimes, our aims are misplaced. The aim of the psalmist was not misplaced. The psalmist tells us that every time there is a movement from death to life, God is behind it. You see, the idea of resurrection is not new to the Christian church. It started long ago with the people of Israel. Time and time again, God would save the people of Israel. And the context of Psalm 118 is that the people have just come back from exile. They were taken away in the years 597 and 586 BCE to the land of Babylon, a land which we now call Iraq. But then in the year 538 BCE, this Persian king named Cyrus came along. He wiped out the Babylonians and he allowed all the people who were captured by the Babylonians, including the people from Jerusalem, to go back home. We might look at this story and say, well, Cyrus did this, right? But the psalmist says, no. Once again, God was behind this movement from death to life. And this isn't just casual piety. This isn't the psalmist trying to be a good church boy. This is actually subversive. This is against all the claims of those who time and time again, throughout Israel's history, said that God could not move his people from death to life. If you remember Exodus chapter 5, Moses encounters Pharaoh. He says, let my people go. And Pharaoh says, why would I do that? I am the king of Egypt, the most powerful man in all the world. What does your God stand against me? Twelve plagues and a Red Sea in the face later, he knows. 1 Samuel 17, we get the story of David and Goliath. Goliath taunts the people of Israel, tells them, I am a giant, your God does not stand a chance against me. And then he gets a stone between the eyes. Once again, God moves his people from death to life. 2 Kings chapter 18, the global superpower at that time was a place called Assyria. And the Assyrians had moved all the way from their home in Mesopotamia, across the Fertile Crescent, back down south. They had conquered all the people, the Hittites, the Arameans, the Sumerians. They had conquered everyone. And Sennacherib, the king of the Assyrians, sends a crony into Jerusalem. And the crony tells the people, the gods of the others could not save them against Sennacherib. What makes you think your God is so great? The next morning, the camp of Sennacherib wakes up to find that most of their army has been slaughtered by an angel of the Lord. Once again, God has moved his people from death to life. And then a few years before our psalm today, there's Psalm 42. And the psalmist records the taunts of those Babylonians who held them in captivity, 
who taunted and mocked them, saying, Where is your God now? Where could he be? But then a King Cyrus Slater, the people are back in the land. The psalmist does not want us to forget that God is the main actor. He says, The Lord was my strength and my protection. He was my saving help. The Lord's strong hand is victorious. The Lord's strong hand is ready to strike. Declare what the Lord has done. You, God, were my saving help. This has happened because of the Lord. And in some translations, it says, this is the day the Lord has acted, rather than this is the day the Lord has made. This is the day the Lord has acted. We will rejoice and be glad in it. God is the main actor. God cannot stand people to mock him. The psalmist here echoes the Apostle Paul from Galatians 6, 7, who says, Make no mistake, God is not mocked. And just as resurrection is a concept as old as the people of Israel, and it reached its peak in the tomb and continues on, we believe God's power is continuing to make all things new. So also eternally is those who mock the fact that God can move us from death to life. There will always be those who mock the fact that our God is a God of resurrection. And they will claim instead that the last word belongs to death. In the year 320 AD, some Christian soldiers were marching through Armenia and uh, their officers, the Roman uh, army officers, decided that they could stand no more of these soldiers who had become Christian, so they decided to put them out on this ice sheet in the middle of winter. They put an ice bath, or uh, I'm sorry, a hot bath around them and said that, it, hey, if you recant of your Christian faith, you can come into this hot bath. And they all died there on that sheet of ice. Just last month in Nigeria, 280 Christians were killed by radical Islamists. And we woke up this morning to news in Sri Lanka. At the last count, 160 were dead, many celebrating Easter in a Christian church. There will always be those who mock our God, who mock that our God can move us from death to life, who mock that our God is a God of resurrection. Now for you and I, hopefully our persecution is not as overt. Ours is a little more subtle. Folks say, how in the world can you believe? Poor, pitiful Christians, how can you believe that there is a God and that God would raise the dead? But the idea of resurrection was never meant to be easy to grasp. It was always a matter of faith and a laughing matter to those without faith. And though for some it is a laughing matter, I know no one for whom this is not a desire of theirs. It is a basic human need to want to move from death to life. Just think of the world of sports. Sports always the great microcosm for life. Last year, two of the biggest jokes in sports were the UVA men's basketball team, the first 16 seed to lose to a one seed in the NCAA tournament, and Tiger Woods, whose personal life had been shattered, his, uh, his golf career had been marred by an injured back. They said he'd never win a major again. And this year, no one is laughing at them. UVA, the men's basketball national champions. Tiger, the masters champion. And I hear no one anymore who says, oh yeah, that was me last year mocking them. Instead, everyone says, this is the story we need to hear. We desire this story of resurrection, the desire to move from death to life. In fact, going back to those soldiers on the ice sheet in Armenia, there was one Roman soldier, one pagan soldier, who looked at these Christians and said, there's something to this. Maybe death doesn't have the last word. Maybe they're right. And he joined them and died with them. You see, here's the thing, even though the movement from death to life may not be believable to some in the abstract, 
Resurrection is writ large in the life of the Christian. People should look at us and see the things that we do and say, you know what, maybe there is something to this. Maybe there is something to this resurrection thing. We believe that God is constantly moving us from death into life. We do not think the addicted need to stay addicted. We do not leave them for dead. We believe that the poor are not to be relegated to the poor, as Jesus preached in his first sermon in Luke chapter 6, that he's come to preach good news to the poor. Even us and our pasts, our pasts do not have to define us. Our pasts can be wiped away. We can move, each of us, from certain death into new life. Maybe folks will look at us and say, you know, this resurrection thing is not just plausible, it's possible. Maybe it's a reality. And maybe God gets the last laugh. You know, in Germany today, uh, Easter Sunday is always a day of laughter. The priests are expected not to put on some serious worship service, but to lead a comedy hour, as it were. And uh, I know several Germans, and I'm guessing this is the only time all year that they laugh. (laughs) But nonetheless, they laugh, and I like this idea. That God is the last laugh. That we might actually be able to mock death itself, not because of our own actions, but because of God. In 1 Corinthians 15, 55, Paul echoes the prophet Hosea. He says, where is your victory, O death? Where is your sting, O death? God gets the last laugh. There's a great theologian by the name of Jean Vanier. Jean Vanier uh, is a French-Canadian theologian. He is a brilliant guy, studied uh, uh, to do his PhD in philosophy and wrote this great dissertation on Aristotle and taught for a while, but he realized that God was nagging at him to do something different with his life. And so he joined a priest friend of his, and they started a home for the developmentally disabled called La Arche, meaning the Ark. For years and years this went on, they would raise uh, and help these folks who had developmental disabilities. And one time, Bonnier was in a meeting with a donor and uh, it was this very serious meeting behind closed doors. And then in burst through the door, one of the residents at La Arche, a man by the name of Jean-Claude. Jean-Claude came into the room. He was laughing. He was just bursting out laughing. He came in and he gave Vanier a hug. He gave the donor a hug. And he was just slapping his knees, laughing, laughing all the way out the door, slammed the door behind him. And the donor looked at Vanier and said, isn't it a shame that people have to live like this? And Vanier just shook his head because we believe that those that are mocked, those that otherwise would be left for dead, have value, may even see new life, may face resurrection. This is who we are because we believe that God has the last laugh, not with death, but with life. A few psalms after ours this morning, the psalmist says, When the Lord changed Zion's circumstances for the better, it was like we had been dreaming. Our mouths were suddenly filled with laughter. Our tongues were filled with shouts of joy. Today, Jesus is risen. Our mouths are filled with laughter. Our tongues with shouts of joy. Because God has done it. God has had the last laugh. We move from death to life. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. God, indeed, you have done it. You have conquered death and all of its companion forces. And what's more, God, you have invited us to laugh in the face of death with you. We confess we don't deserve it or even sometimes understand it. But we do confess that you alone are behind it all. Thank you for this grace and much more we cannot even comprehend. In Christ's name we pray, our risen Savior. Amen.